Hi, my name is Mervyn Chua, and I am in the Meriton Family Program at uh, the University of Central Oklahoma. And my name is Sandy Guzman, and I am in the School Psychology Program here at the University of Central Oklahoma. Our video today is going to focus on a brief overview of what insomnia is, who it affects, and what treatment options are currently available. Insomnia is a common sleep disorder where a person has difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, and waking up throughout the night. Insomnia affects the quantity and quality of sleep, so people who have insomnia may not feel well rested despite having plenty of sleep opportunities. Insomnia leads to a person having daytime problems. Since they're not getting restorative sleep, it can lead to fatigue, problems with concentration, irritability, and health problems, which all lead to problems in a person's social, occupational, and educational life. If you're not able to sleep, essentially you're not able to function properly. Insomnia disorder is the most prevalent sleep disorder. The risk for developing insomnia is relatively stable across the lifespan and it affects about 20% of the general population. So if it takes longer than 30 minutes to fall asleep, and it's occurring three nights out of the week, then it's been occurring for at least three months, then it would be important to seek your treatment options. Insomnia can develop for no reason. Sometimes it's for medical reasons, especially if it's related to pain or if a person has a pulmonary disease, or it can be from mental health issues like anxiety or depression. The onset of insomnia can occur at any time with the first episode being most common in young adulthood. You see it less frequently in children, but when you see it in children, it's usually from conditioning factors. For example, a child may not be able to go to sleep without their parent present or because there's no consistent sleep schedule or bedtime routine, as well as modeling from the parents. If the parents don't have healthy sleep habits, then the children learn to adapt and they start doing what the parents are doing. There are gender differences with insomnia being more prevalent in females. It is usually associated with the birth of a new child, with menopause, and in adolescent females, it may be related to hormone changes. Before beginning a treatment such as CBT, it is important to rule out bad sleep habits. Sometimes the solution to sleep problems can be resolved by implementing good sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene are habits that will help you have a good night's sleep. Good sleep hygiene include things such as sleeping and waking up at the same time each day, exercise, reducing alcohol, avoiding daytime naps, avoiding caffeine and smoking in the evening, and not going to bed hungry. Another treatment option to consider before using CBT would be to try stimulus control. This is where you only use the bed for sleeping. This means that you cannot use your bed to watch TV, to do homework, or anything else. You learn to associate that you only use the bed for sleeping and for sleeping only. You also want to make sure that your room is comfortable, that there's no lights. This means you shouldn't use, you shouldn't keep your phone on you or by you while you're trying to fall asleep because it can be a distraction, especially with the lights and the noise. You want to make sure that you, the room is at a comfortable temperature so you don't want it to be too hot or too cold. And most importantly, make sure that it's dark. If you're not able to fall back asleep, you would want to get up and do something else and not just lay there. So I'm going to be talking about the CBT aspect of uh, insomnia disorders. And uh, so we're going to start with the uh, pre-treatment assessment. And um, in the pre-treatment assessment, I think that it is um, crucial that both the caregiver and the child um, be present. Because the thing about kids, we all know that um, with their brain development, they need lots of guidance and, a lot, and they need lots of uh, modeling. So I think it's important that um, parents be just as motivated as your kids or even more motivated sometimes um, in order for, um, for this to work. So the first aspect of uh, the pre-treatment assessment is um, the clinical interview. So in the clinical interview, um, a sleep questionnaire will be given to the parent or the, or the child. And um, the sleep questionnaire will discuss certain things like sleep hygiene, um, substance use, treatment history, medical history, and also psych psychiatric factors. Um, a few common pre-assessment tools that are used are the Insomnia Severity Index, the ISI, or the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index. So these two are the most popular ones so far. 
So one of the tools that we use for pre-assessment is the sleep log. And um, part of the sleep log is to aid case formulation. So we all know that each individual is different. So each client will be different. So um, part of the sleep log is uh, it may help identify other causes of, of insomnia. So for example, if there is sleep, if bad sleep hygiene involved, that, um, that can be taken care of as well using the sleep log. Um, the sleep log also helps uh, monitor sleep patterns for two weeks. So if we learn uh, the sleep habits of our clients, for example, if they're getting up at 2 a.m. for some reason every morning, um, there are certain things that can be discussed to help them get back to sleep. So learning the sleep pattern will help um, the clients just be more aware of what's happening and uh, maybe by that they can fix the problem. Um, Usually the sleep log is monitored on a single sheet so that way it's more organized. You can look at all the information in one glance and it's also easy to read. And um, the clients are also encouraged to complete the sleep log 30 minutes after waking up. We all know that we get busy so by the time sometimes people drink their coffee or by the time they start the day, they tend to forget what has happened. So that's why they're encouraged to just finish it 30 minutes as soon as they get up. So now we're going to move on to um, session one. So for session one, it is important for us as a therapist to provide on uh, the purpose of treatment. Um, when you go into therapy, you always want to know what's going to be happening. So that's why an agenda is, is important. We don't want to be springing up certain, certain ideas or certain activities that our clients might be uncomfortable with just suddenly. So um, part of the providing purpose of treatment is to let them know what goes into this treatment and why it would be effective. We all know that um, oftentimes we only do things if it makes sense to us. So if we were to explain that way clients might be more motivated because they see the sense and they see the logic in the, in the purpose of treatment. So um, we will also talk about how um, CBT for insomnia is intended to correct the sleep related misconceptions and sleep disruptive habits that contribute to insomnia. So for example, some people believe that um, alcohol, for instance, helps them sleep. That is true. Uh, we do fall asleep easier after consuming alcohol, but we uh, never get into REM3, which is a phase where uh, we need to sleep to get, um, to get full rest. So by drinking alcohol, we don't go into REM3, which is deep sleep which is why oftentimes people get up after drinking alcohol, feeling really dizzy, or they feel like it's not restful. Um, other sleep disruptive habits can include like having your dog sleep with you, for instance. We all know that um, sleeping with another person is hard enough, but um, with an animal, it could maybe disrupt our sleep. And um, part of session one is also providing sleep education. So it is good for clients to know what normal is in terms of sleep. So they may think that sleeping five hours is normal, or they may think that sleeping 12 hours is normal. But um, based off of research, a fully fledged adult should be sleeping around eight to 10 hours. So even sometimes discussing um, what quote unquote normal time for sleeping for an average adult is will really help um, clients compare themselves. And part of session one is also explaining um, how the human biological sleep works. So there are three phases, REM1, REM2, REM3, so all that jazz. So now we're going to talk about sleep rules. And um, there are six sleep rules that our clients should follow to ensure um, better sleep each night. So number one would be select the standard wake-up time. We all have phones, right? Technology has made things like that easier. So set an alarm for um, the same time every day because that way your body knows the exact time to get up every day and, and a routine is set. Number two is um, use the bed only for sleeping. We know, that, we know that it's sometimes um, comfortable to lay in bed to study or lay in bed to watch Netflix. But our research has shown that, um, that we should only use our bed for sleeping because that way the brain will associate bed for sleep. So when you lie down, the brain starts to wind down. And brain knows that it's time to go to bed. Um, number three is get up when you can't sleep. So getting up when you can't sleep is important. What people usually do is they lay in bed for hours and end trying to get to sleep. 
Um, but research shows that um, if you can't go to sleep for 20 minutes, get up, do something, because that probably means that your brain is not ready to go to sleep. So get up, maybe do something relaxing, and then try to go back to sleep again. Um, number four is don't worry or plan in bed. Um, a lot of times we keep our brains active because we're thinking of um, the things that have to be done the next day or we're worrying about something. And that, that definitely does not help the brain wind down and go to sleep. And number six is um, go to bed when you're sleepy, but not before the time suggested. Remember we talked about uh, a sleep routine. So um, just as getting up at the same time is important, I think setting a sleep schedule, so trying to go to sleep at a certain time is important too. And um, that can be done um, using the, the TIB prescription, which is the time in bed. So what do you use to determine what time you go to bed? Um, first of all, you need to, to determine what time you need to be up the next morning. So for example, if you need to be up at 6 a.m., um, the amount of hours that you need to sleep will determine what time you go to bed. So how you do that, you use the sleep diary from the pre-assessment, the two weeks um, log that you use. And um, the, um, the way you count it is called the TIV prescription, which is a time in bed. And um, through those two weeks uh, of log that you clocked in, you, you count the average total time of sleep time plus, plus 30 minutes. Wrapping up session one would probably be assigning homework. Um, one of the homework would be um, to make sure that your client continues to have a record of their sleep patterns, so that means the sleep log. And um, part of the homework is also to make sure that your client actually remembers the sleep rules and also think of ways that, um, that they can implement the sleep rules. And so now we're going to move on to session two. And um, it is important as a therapist for you to recap um, your past session because we all know that um, we all work on different schedules and so sometimes our sessions may not be on a weekly basis and sometimes there are also homework that we give our clients that has to be done over a period of time. So it's always important as a therapist to, um, to recap last, um, last session to the client just so the client knows um, that we're both on the same page. And after that, you would uh, probably discuss your homework. So remember the homework that you gave to your client a couple of weeks before or the last session. Um, it would be good to discuss some of the roadblocks that um, maybe deter them from completing their homework or maybe ask them um, what were some of the, uh, the, the discouragements that happened. And that way you can always tweak. Um, if you find out that it's a motivation problem, you can work on that. If you find that um, there's some environmental um, issues that that not encourage them to do their homework, you can also discuss that and um, address the problems. So after you've discussed the homework, you can start um, reviewing the session agenda. So like I said earlier, it is important um, that our clients know the plan of the session and that way they will know where they are in the treatment. And um, one thing that is important is, is also flexibility. We don't want to be rigid so rigid in our treatment plan that our clients find really stuck. So um, some um, organize, organization is good obviously, but also flexibility would be great because we all know that each client is different, so they have different pace. So just letting them know um, what we're gonna be doing for this session can just help them gauge where they are. So the first real part of our CBT for session two is on discussing constructive worry technique. So what, ha what happens is um, if, what if a client is unable to go to sleep because they're thinking of something or something's bothering them and their brain is active and just won't let them go to sleep. So which is why we'll be talking about um, discussing the constructive worry technique. So there are five steps to it. And um, step one is um, there's a sheet of paper that under concerns, they can write down the biggest problems that, that are most likely to keep them awake at night. So let's do an example. Um, let's say it's a teenager needing money to go to a concert. So step two would be thinking of potential solutions to help fix the problem. Um, we have to also remind our clients that it might not necessarily have to be the final solution. We all know that problems all work in steps. So um, just writing up potential solutions, even if it's the next step to helping solve the problem, will, will help ease some of the, uh, the problems. Um, so, for example, we talked about a teenager wanting to go to a concert but not having money, for instance. 
So a possible um, small solution would be thinking ways to earn money. So it could be maybe doing extra chores or uh, babysitting or even limiting unnecessary spending like Starbucks. We all know that we spent sometimes too much money on coffee. Um, number three would be uh, repeat this for other concerns. So if um, the teenager has other problems that's bothering them besides um, the money problem for the concert, they should also list the same steps. And um, the last thing um, for that step is an important one, is to actually fold up your paper after you've done with it and leave it alone. Um, sometimes we tend to still obsess, so we, I know that it's hard to do that, but a client should, um, should be encouraged to, after writing all those things down, to fold up the paper, put it away, and actually try to go to sleep. So what happens if, despite even after putting your paper away, you still worry? Um, one of the steps is to uh, just remind yourself that um, you have dealt with part of the problems or you actually have a solution. Um, remind yourself that you can be working on them tomorrow. And um, the third thing would probably, this logical sense and just telling yourself that um, there's nothing much you can do while you're tired. So it's better to get some sleep so that tomorrow you can be ready to seize the day. So part of the CBT treatment for insomnia is also um, using thought records. So um, thought records are intended to restructure negative thoughts about insomnia. Um, sometimes we don't realize that um, our thoughts actually impact um, our sleep pattern. So for example, um, if I'm going to bed worrying that I won't be able to go to bed, um, what are the chances of um, self-fulfilling prophecy happening? So um, there are a few aspects to the, uh, the thought records. Um, as you can see there, there is um, the situation, there is mood, there is evidence for the thought, there is evidence against the thought, there is an adaptive, adaptive coping statement, and um, the last one is do you feel any differently? So under situation, you would put um, things like, what were you doing when the, when the thought occurred? Um, where were you? What, what was the environment? Sometimes you may find that um, if you do this enough, you may find a, a theme that, um, for example, um, it may be that, that a client um, could not sleep because they watched a, a movie about a Grinch, for example, um, in their childhood. And so not every time um, they watch another movie that reminds them of that, that automatic thought comes up. So in this situation, um, that, that would help the client be aware of um, what they were doing when the thought triggered. If you do these things um, enough, sometimes you find a theme. For example, um, maybe a certain music, certain type of music it brings up an automatic thought because of something that happened in the past. Or maybe a certain smell or maybe just anything in the environment. So um, by using the thought record, sometimes clients are able to identify certain triggers that bring up the, um, the negative thought that may be helping them not sleep. Second part is the mood. So what were you feeling when the negative thought entered your mind? Were you happy? Were you sad? So just list that down. So the thought records are also used as part of CBT in insomnia. And uh, what these thought records is mainly for is to help clients who have negative um, these beliefs about insomnia to help cope with them. So for example, um, if someone is worrying about not being able to go to sleep at night, um, what are the chances of them actually not going to sleep that night because they're too worried, they're too busy worrying about it, self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, the thought record is to help clients um, reframe, if you will, um, the, negative, the negative thoughts or beliefs. So number one would be a um, situation where um, they would list down um, when the negative thought happened, um, what were they doing, what was the environment. Sometimes you may find that uh, they might have a, a, a subconscious um, trigger that, that they did not realize that the environment had something to, to do with. Number two, what was their mood? Um, do they tend to get more uh, negative thoughts when they're sad or maybe when they're happy? So it just depends. Stressful times especially um, are known to trigger automatic negative thoughts. And then number three would be, um, what are the thoughts themselves? It could be um, things like, I will never be able to go to sleep at 11. So with 
thoughts like that, like I talk about self-fulfilling prophecy, um, with thoughts like that, um, they may eventually not even be able to go to sleep because of that. The third column is thoughts. So what are the actual negative thoughts that came in? So writing them down will be important. Um, many clients, they tend to, um, to go for the all or nothing approach and they use strong words like always or never. So things like I never go to bed at 11 although I try or I'm always sleeping late. So all those things, um, writing those down can help give a, a perspective to the client and uh, as a therapist you can start reframing those those thoughts. Um, the next one would be evidence for the thought. So for example, the example I used earlier was um, I can never go to sleep at 11. Is it really true though? Um, some therapists can can question their client. You know, maybe they, they just started not being able to go to sleep at 11 but saying that they have never ever ever gone to bed before 11 seems a bit of a stretch. And um, number the next one is um, evidence against the thought. So again, the client can say, you know, surely when you were a child, or surely maybe five years ago, um, before a certain stress happened or before a certain event happened, you were able to, to sleep. So um, that helps the client um, visualize a chance for them to change. Because the thing about it is if, if the clients um, are stuck in the belief that they cannot change or something cannot happen, the chances of change is very slim. And then um, the next one would be adaptive, adaptive or coping statement. So that's when you work with um, the client to do self-talk. So that can be um, calming themselves down, it can be meditation, it can be telling themselves, okay, uh, I need to calm down and um, I need to go to sleep and actually try to go to sleep. And then the next one would be, um, do you feel any differently after um, completing all this? Because that will help the client. So the adaptive and the yeah, coping statement is basically what you can tell yourself to help yourself a little bit. And then the last one is um, do you feel any differently? So acknowledging how you feel after doing the process will, um, will help you figure out whether this method is working or if something else needs to be done. It is also important as a therapist to actually do the worksheet with your client because uh, for many of them it's going to be a new thing. So even uh, filling up each column will give them a better idea of how to uh, complete it when they're on their own. So after sessions one and two, the rest of the sessions are just pretty much um, follow-up sessions. So in those sessions, you'll be um, discussing maybe certain roadblocks or environmental, other environmental factors that, uh, that may deter the uh, client from sleeping. Or uh, you might also um, readjust the TIB, the time in bed prescription. So for example, if they did do it and, uh, they, f then, and they have been following it and um, apparently seven hours for them is not enough. So that's when you would adjust it and you encourage them to try eight hours and uh, to see if um, that amount of hours slept, the new number of hours slept is, uh, is enough for them. And then um, Last one is probably just to encourage and reinforce um, treatment. Let your client know that um, progress is progress, no matter how small, and that it should be celebrated. And we know that sometimes it's easy to get discouraged because we want um, results right away, but we know that it's a longer process. So even talking them through it and even encouraging them on a weekly basis, um, raising their morale, and also building the therapeutic relationship is also really important to make sure that um, your client is able to successfully change.